I heard voices singing. And I looked at my sound man and I said, where is this coming from? I thought I was hearing things, but he, he heard it too. Coming from the ruins of the largest cathedral in the Far East. People were singing for the holidays. 1945 in Nagasaki. So we went up there and we backlit the area and put in a little dolly and moved the camera. And I'd look out and see complete devastation. And hear the voices. One day in early August, I reported to the Hiroshima branch of my news rail company, where I met the head man named Morikawa. Please go back to Tokyo, he advised. He had heard a rumor that a new bomb might be dropped on the city around August 6th or 7th. I left Hiroshima that night after a stay of only three days. I went back to Tokyo by train and at 8.15 on August 6th. My train arrived at the Hiroshima station on August 7th, the day after the bombing on the way to filming at the military base. From the platform, you could see smoke still rising from the people who formerly lived in the city. I no longer knew what to think. It was just a single bomb, and Hiroshima had nearly vanished in an instant. On the 9th of August, military authorities announced that the enemy used special bombs again at Nagasaki. As I returned to Tokyo by train, we stopped in Hiroshima again. An offensive order entered the car. Nothing was alive, and it seems like there was no voice in the atomic desert. When I returned to our headquarters in Tokyo, I said, we must make a record of Hiroshima as soon as possible. The headman at the newsreel company telephoned our Osaka branch and ordered the cameraman Kashiwara to rush to the scene. Also sent was a second cameraman named Masaki. There was no attention paid to the radiation, as its danger was not yet known. 
Kashiwara managed to get to Hiroshima He captured what he saw in his camera, including the shadows of humans burned into the pavement. I visited one of the facilities where the bomb survivors were. And the stench made me sick. They all looked as if their souls had been sucked out of their bodies. When I addressed them, they made no response. Kashiwada rushed the negative to Tokyo. On August 12th, his boss screened the film at the Japanese army office. This told the army for the first time the truth of what Hiroshima had suffered six days earlier. This print was confiscated on the spot. The army feared that its release might decimate morale among the populace. The American army showed up three weeks later after our surrender. The US feared that the secret of the bomb might be revealed to other countries such as the Soviet Union. So it seized the film. The second film shot by Masaki was also sent to our headquarters, but it suffered the same fate as Kashiwara's footage. On September 7, 1945, one month after the bombings, I put three days worth of rice in a rack sack and departed Tokyo alone. I had now been informed about the radioactivity, so I fringed when I got off at the Hiroshima station. The scientists still had no reliable data regarding the bomb's power, how long the radiation would remain, and how strong it was. The film staff would have to work in this hazardous zone, but all members were grimly determined. One cameraman told me that when he was put on this film crew, it felt like a sentence of death. And there's no doubt that this was a true mental state of every member of the crew. Another cameraman had just gotten married, but he and his new wife had exchanged sake cups before he left for Hiroshima, as if they were resigned to never seeing one another again. In the classrooms of an elementary school, battery injured adults and children lie mourning. There was no medicine. The doctors and nurses worked frantically, although they too were injured. Even as they worked, people continued to die one after another. The camera captured the symptoms of what we called atomic bomb disease. It was the first time for me to photograph people like this. A boy on the ash-ridden floor looked at the ceiling with his eyes open. My hair felt like it was standing on end. The next day, I went to help Mr. Yamanaka's medical team. There were too many patients and no medicine that works for A-bomb survivors. There were women with a striped pattern on their robes, clearly burned into their shoulders and backs. When I was a child, 
I heard that when a person who did bad things when he was alive died and went to hell, he would be cut into pieces with a knife. I now saw this story in this world. I was military, in for the duration. In Tokyo, Colonel McCrary told me, Mac, we're just about finished now. We're going down to the islands, to Australia, over into China. Or do you want to go home? But I said, no, Colonel, I could go home, but there's a story that has to be told here about the Japanese people in defeat, even if I have to do this damn thing myself. So I flew to a base outside Nagasaki with a group of newspaper reporters. Later, in October, I obtained enough camera equipment and film to start shooting the only color footage anyone ever shot there. First time I got into Nagasaki and saw the horror and the devastation, it was pathetic. You'd be going along streets that were in ruins and, and no buildings in sight. Buildings crushed as if a massive anvil had fallen down and destroyed them. People were lying by the roadside like sick animals. Going down through the city, following whatever road you could find, you'd see people in caves, in shelters, in what at one time was their home. And some of them would be searching for, picking up the remains of some family member. The poor children were really suffering. They had a lost look, staring at me as if to say, who are you, what have you done? Being a cameraman, you can't be a tourist or a spectator. You have to do your job. You can't think about how bad it is, but you know it's bad. What bothered me the most was at a school where hundreds died, Shiriyama School. There were hundreds of bones and crushed skulls piled up, stacked up from the children, just laying in the corner. But I recall one day a group of young boys and girls came marching up the hillside, singing. I, I can still see it. A young girl was eating an apple, enjoying every single bit of it. That at least made me feel good. Later arriving in Hiroshima, I learned that it was entirely different. Nagasaki is hilly, and anything in the valley was destroyed by the blast. Anything on the other side of the hill wasn't even touched. In Hiroshima, the devastation was wider because it's all flatland. There was nothing there to resist the blast, so it just spread out like a tidal wave. Hiroshima was the most barren place I have ever seen. Everything was gone.
The only thing left standing was the industrial hall, which has the famous large dome. That's still standing today. But that was the epicenter. And right close to it was a hospital that was completely gone. There were all sorts of odd things. One thing that often struck me were the unusual shadows. For example, a ladder on a building was transposed and you could see the outline as a reversed image. Same thing could be seen throughout the city. It was characteristic of the atomic bomb because the heat was so intense. But uh, there were all sorts of weird things. I remembered the shadow on the granite steps of the bank where a man was seated at the time of the blast. To recreate it visually, I had a person sitting there wearing similar clothes and then had him stand up. Now you could see the shadow where the earlier person, who was probably vaporized, was seated. The strange part is there was a lot of misery, but I rarely saw anyone cry. They took their pain with them. There was a character about the Japanese people. They were embarrassed to a certain degree about starting the war. I had been shooting alone in Nagasaki since September 16th. Now it was October 1945. We are most concerned about the effects on human bodies. We got to know some victims while shooting. And days later, when we called on them, they were already gone. Corpses were carried down to basement rooms. It was a terrible scene we'd want to look away from. I didn't visit Hiroshima and Nagasaki during the filming, and yet I was to become one of the people most familiar with the true nature of the atom bomb. That's because once the film was sent to our Tokyo headquarters, I was at every screening of the rushes in a frigid basement room. My retina absorbed every last detail of the reality as witnessed by the cameras. Every frame was burnt into my memory. Even when something appeared that made me want to avert my gaze, I would stare at it, feeling my heart choked with emotion, store it away in my memory, never to be forgotten. I may have been always at the Tokyo office, but my eyes and my spirit were with Hiroshima and Nagasaki too. Aside from direct survivors, there were very few Japanese people who had learned the most important details about the atomic bomb. Then there was an unexpected incident. It happened on October 21st, two months after the bombings. Cameraman Sekiguchi was detained by the American Army Police in the Nagasaki Ground Zero area and taken to the U.S. Army Railway Office. This is where the U.S. first learned that the Japanese were shooting footage of atomic bomb. An order quickly came back from MacArthur's headquarters in Tokyo that our film was forbidden and our footage was suddenly taken away. This set in motion the 30-year destiny of the bearing of our atomic bomb film. Now we have been forced to put the halt to filming in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. We heard that an American cameraman named McGovern had shot 16mm color of the aftermath of the bomb. But since his footage was not sufficient, 
the US wanted to use the footage we had shot to supplement it. Now our filming would proceed under the Americans, but at least we could complete this historic document with our own hands. While I was in Nagasaki, I ran across a group of cameramen. One of them said they had been shooting there for weeks and that the Marines had told them to get out, to get lost. I saw the potential there. They had been there long before I got there. I decided the best thing to do was to tell them they would be working for me. We saved that material from being destroyed, partly because the U.S. Surgeon General wanted to see medical footage. If I hadn't acted, someone, the Army especially, would have destroyed everything. There was a move afoot in MacArthur's headquarters to not finish that production. When the Nippon Aiga Shaw people finished shooting, I took the whole crew and put them up on the seventh floor of the Meiji building in Tokyo. From there, I supervised seven of them doing the editing and the finalization of the Japanese version. The editing of the film was under the supervision of the US military, but still, everyone worked hard. This print was delivered to the US Army as promised and with English narration. It was entitled, The Effects of the Atomic Bomb. After the first screening, the US Army officers and scientists who saw it were shaking our hands and congratulating us. But we who made the film felt unhappy. Its very title pained us. To speak of the effect was to say that the bombs have been effective in making rubble of both cities and killing hundreds of thousands of people. Our aim had not been to film the effect. We had set out to film a disaster. When I came back to Tokyo from Nagasaki, I went up to the Meiji building. My orders were almost running out. I was introduced to General Orville Anderson, who was the military advisor to the U.S. Strategic Bombing Survey. I told him what I had seen down in Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Anderson said, that story must be told before the grass turns green. He said, anything you need, McGovern, just let me know. So I got ready to finish what I had started the previous autumn, this time in 20 cities. I hired an ace Japanese cameraman from a Tokyo studio who had shot films in Hollywood named Harry Mamura. Then there was a young lieutenant named Herbert Susson. He was only 24 years old, but he had a background in writing and other skills. I was glad to have him. I was able to equip a special train. We had five flat cars to carry jeeps, plus uh, Pullman sleepers and a dining car. I had my own cook. I wasn't doing too badly for a first lieutenant.
When we were assigned to shoot this film for the strategic bombing survey, we saw it as a wonderful chance to travel to Japan for free before returning home. I looked on this as a great lark. In January 1946, we arrived at Nagasaki first. No one had prepared me for what we would see. I was shocked by what came into view. The tracks cut through miles of utter ruin. The factories had been pushed down as if by a giant hand. I could not believe what one bomb one little bomb could do. From that moment, my life was changed forever. After touring the city and seeing the condition of the survivors, we asked Washington if we could stay longer in Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Documenting the survivors was not our initial orders, but now we set out to tell the full story, which Americans had been denied so far. We ordered all the color film in the Pacific, which was still a rare thing. We decided to film all the survivors we could find in Nagasaki hospitals. We were the only people with the time and equipment to make a full record of this hidden holocaust. And the only ones shooting in color. It was shocking to see glass shards from windows embedded in the walls. And blood still on the ceilings. I felt if we did not capture this horror on film, no one would ever understand what had happened here. I thought, if people could only see this, it would be the greatest argument for peace the world has ever seen. I was amazed by the total cooperation of nearly every patient. I told them that if they allowed this filming, the world would see what had been hidden and hopefully this tragedy would never happen again. Many of them, of course, died after we filmed them. They had massive infections, or suffered horribly from radiation sickness. Now, I didn't even know what radiation was until then. The worst case of all, a boy of 16, Tanaguchi, who was kept alive in a bath of penicillin. Only raw flesh on his back could be seen. I shuddered when our hot lights were turned on him. No one expected him to live, but the doctors persisted even though he asked them to let him die and end his misery. Then we left for Hiroshima. There, our cameraman, Harry Mamura, who was a true artist, would find unusual and striking scenes to film. I often went out with him as McGovern sometimes returned to Tokyo. I was determined to film the famous gate at the Gokoku Shrine from an elevated angle. But how to do this? An idea came to me when I passed the fire station. 
a lot of tracks had in the garage, and they had no use for it, as all of the local buildings had already burned down thanks to the bomb. I met the chief and negotiated along. The next day, I brought a ladder track to the gate and set it up. It was the same principle as a crane used in movie photography. But I was also put in charge of a more painful filming job, even in a war between two countries. Why must innocent civilians suffer? For days, I had to work with Americans who had dropped the bomb and filmed Japanese victims who had the same skin color as me and spoke the very same language. But the cameraman must face up to whatever he films, however horrible. It struck me that this film record would someday, in some way, come to serve a purpose. After the patients were taken out on the roof of the hospital, one after another in front of the camera, the hospital director took off his shirt and turned his back. There were scars all over. When the bomb was dropped, he had stood next to a large window. It was then that he received the shattered fragments of glass all over his back. We came to admire the truly heroic and terribly overworked doctors and nurses at the Red Cross Hospital in Hiroshima. So we were happy to film a ceremony there welcoming a new class of badly needed young nurses. very unhappy with the editing of our film that was ordered by the U.S. and still hope to create our own version. But then one or two days after we screened it for the Americans, two U.S. soldiers came looking for me in my office. They gave me a written order from MacArthur's headquarters to hand over all of our footage, including the negative and all outtakes. It amounted to total confiscation. I told them that we would cooperate, but I would need to organize what we had. When they returned the next day, I was asked to sign a written pledge that there wasn't a single frame of film left. I signed it, but I was acting as a more honorable human being by lying. The truth is, we who made this film could not accept that the US would confiscate it, removing every trace of it from Japan. I knew that we had to keep the film in Japan at any cost. We came up with an idea. We would set aside a set of prints that had not been edited or have sound. Put broadly, we were conspiring against the occupation. It needed to involve just me and three others so we would not endanger anyone else. We knew that we risked a long sentence in a US military prison. So we couldn't continue storing the film on our premises. We decided to leave it for safekeeping at the office of Shigeru Miki, the cameraman who had shot some of the footage. Needless to say, we didn't disclose to him what it was. One day, someone brought a package of film to my office saying, can you look after this? 
and I hit it in the ceiling. And for the six years between then and the end of the American occupation, the concealed film rested peacefully. After finishing in Hiroshima and the other cities, we headed back to Tokyo. Most of our footage had been sent to Hollywood for processing. On June 14th, I got an order from General Anderson directing us to return to Washington at once. I hand carried to the US the negative and a print of the Japanese black and white film. I asked General Anderson if it might be possible for a public release of all this material, possibly through Hollywood. Warner Brothers was already interested. Arrangements were made to screen the Japanese film for the Army, Navy, the Atomic Energy Commission, plus intelligence people. After the screening, I was told that this material could not be released to the news media nor to the general public. I was told the material will be classified secret. I was disappointed, but I took the negative and had a 16 millimeter print made. I left it in a depository. And I never heard any more about it. In 1967, a print of our original Japanese film, the copy made by Daniel McGovern, was quietly returned to Japan by the US. When the well-known writer on documentary films, Eric Barnall, learned about this, he obtained a copy from the National Archives. From this old and grainy footage, Barnall produced a 16-minute film exactly one-tenth the length of our original. I was deeply moved by the film. I knew every cut of it, yet I was speechless. It was not the kind of film we Japanese thought the Americans would ever produce. color footage. I got into the lab at the Pentagon and processed the material and got prints made. But the only thank you I got was from General Anderson. Nobody else cared. I was told by people in the Pentagon that hell no and damn no, they didn't want those images out because they showed effects on man, women, and child. They didn't want the public to know what their weapons had done at a time when they were planning on more bombs. In the meantime, all of the footage was transferred to the Air Force Depository at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio. And I ended up there to catalog it. When I came back to the US, I had a hard time processing what I'd seen in Japan. So later, in 1946, I put together a book of photos and submitted it to General Anderson and to President Truman. Of course, I wanted to make a film or TV program based on our footage to warn the world about these weapons. 
the American public still had only seen the bomb's effects in photos of rubble, not people, and all in grainy black and white. I was disappointed to learn that our footage was classified, and I did not even know where it was stored. In 1950, I wrote the White House, but an aide to President Truman said the Air Force had determined that the footage was too scientific and lacked, quote, wide public appeal or information value. Was it already too late? We had invented the hydrogen bomb and the arms race with the Russians was hot. I talked to Edward R. Murrow, a star at CBS, and he said he'd look into it. But then he told me he should not get involved. He didn't give me his reasons. When I got to NBC, I tried the two anchors, Huntley and Brinkley, but that also went nowhere. And still, the public had not seen any color images. I was just an individual. I didn't have an organization behind me, and I had a growing family. But in 1962, I talked to Robert F. Kennedy, who was consulted on a TV series, but his office would not or could not get the film declassified. Then, in a bit of good luck, after I went to Screen Gems to work, they launched a series in 1964 on President Truman's key decisions. My wife and I had lunch with Truman a couple of times in New York. He said he wasn't even aware of the footage, but he would check on it. He discovered the same thing. It allegedly could not be declassified. Finally, I learned that my old boss, Dan McGovern, had been keeping track of all the footage the entire time. I went to Norton Air Force Base in California around 1970, and he directed me to a card catalog, which indicated the footage was still classified. Then another stroke of luck. Around 1980, I read that an exhibit of newly discovered photos from atom bomb Japan was opening at the United Nations near my apartment. I was shocked when I saw stills from the footage we had shot. When I alerted the Japanese organizer, he went home and started a grassroots movement to purchase all of our color footage from the National Archives. I didn't even know it had been declassified years earlier in a routine move. The Japanese made the first films using the footage. One of them was narrated by Jane Fonda. By the time I found out that my footage was available, I was suffering from lymphoma. My doctor said it might have been caused by radiation exposure in Japan but I spoke out strongly for the growing anti-nuclear movement. Soon, I was invited to Hiroshima. I met a woman named Numata we had filmed in 1946, and she remembered me. Amazingly, I learned that the boy Taniguchi we had filmed had survived grown to an adult, married, and had children, and was now a leading anti-nuclear activist. Until then, Americans still had not been allowed to see any color footage from the atomic cities. But now I was happy to see images I had shot being used in many films, though only in brief excerpts. I will never know if our footage and the Japanese film might have made the world safer from nuclear weapons if it had been shown to the public instead of buried for so many years. 
I believe that if anyone today uses modern nuclear weapons, many times more powerful than the ones used against Japan, the world is over. To hear officials speak of limited nuclear war is horrendous. Nuclear war instead represents the end of everything. Uh, when the film, when I finally arrived in Washington and the Pentagon learned of my being there with the film, the film was classified top secret.